the chair of the session, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good morning to you all and assalamu alaikum. So, and welcome to the session uh, on the blue economy and the maritime security. And uh, as the uh, first speaker of the session, I think this is my turn uh, to embark upon this journey in the ocean and to uh, give you some glimpses of hope that really lies ahead uh, to the south side of Bangladesh, uh, which is the Bay of Bengal and the ocean beyond. Uh, generally, <coughs> in Bangladesh, uh, we call that the ocean is our new frontier. We, are, we have got on one or uh, three sides, we have got India, one side Myanmar, but the sa side that we have to the south is the ocean. I think that's a new frontier to us, and that is a new frontier which remains to be explored. Ladies and gentlemen, oceans are source of important resources. There are huge amount of vital resources, and the ocean also maintains the biodiversity. Ocean is also responsible to ensure the various aspects of the climate change issues, and we are really now con concerned about the biodiversity and the ecosystem integrity of the oceans. Oceans contribute to the poverty er eradication, and oceans are also engine for global economic growth and food security. There are huge you know, organic and inorganic resources in the ocean that remains to be explored. There are a lot of untapped potentials in the ocean. Nowadays, we talk about the blue economy, and I will also try to touch upon what are the aspects of the blue economy that we really need to understand so that we really can contribute to the overall economic development of the country where blue economy plays an important part. You talk about the international shipping and the ports, they provide the crucial linkage to the global supply chains. Around 80% of the global trade takes place through the sea. And that is the connection that Bangladesh has got to the rest of the world by the ocean. The ocean is universal. There is no fixed boundary on the ocean. The boundaries are imaginary. The UNCLOS or the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea in 1982 gives us the authority to go anywhere in the ocean up to any distance you know though the 12 nautical mile is the territorial water even within the 12 nautical mile of a of any coastal state we can go for innocent passage so ocean is universal and we need to explore the ocean and exploit the resources for the economic benefit of our country and the region but oceans require caring attention and coordinated action there is a term called IUU fishing. So, what is IUU fishing? Illegal, unregistered, and unregulated fishing. There is overexploitation of fishing. Now, this IUU fishing, the pollution from the land pollution and the sea based pollution, and many other malpractices that we, we see on the ocean really cause harm to the ocean degrade the biodiversity of the ocean and ultimately it brings down the growth of the economy of the country so we need to be careful about it so we should also be careful about the fact that the oceans are interconnected and all the disciplines marine issues are interconnected because there are many marine activities in same space the tourism industries that our keynote speaker talked a little while earlier takes place in the same place where the industries, other coastal industries or the economic zones are built, where the fishing practices are, take, are taking place. So how to do about it? We need ocean governance. And that is why, you see, the ocean governance, what is that? Ocean governance is, is an integrated policy, actions, and affairs of world's oceans for sustainable use of coastal and marine resources without degrading the biodiversity of the ocean. So we need fundamental and systemic changes in the policy, 
regulatory, regulatory management and governance framework. The policies need to be framed properly. The regulatory bodies need to monitor properly. The management issues are there that we need to take care of and above all the governance issues. All four across the range we need. And what we need? We need an ocean policy vision for that to chart a course towards the blue horizon. So these are some of the issues that I'll be, I'll be talking, making some quick glimpses. Strategy importance of the Bay of, the Bay of Bengal, the challenges of blue economy, prospects and potentials, ocean governance. Finally, what are the initiatives Bangladesh government has taken and what is the way ahead? Firstly, just look at this particular uh, map of the Indian Ocean itself. You see, okay, it doesn't work. So, there are various choke points in the Indian Ocean. And on the right side, you can see the Malaysia, Indonesia, that is the, there lies the Malacca Strait. On the left bottom, there is the Cape of Good Hope. On the left top, where the Egypt is written, there we know the Suez Canal and the Babel Mandeb near the Yemen Djibouti. Then we have got the Hormuz Strait going in the Persian Gulf or the Arab Arabian Gulf. Just imagine all these particular choke points have been historically for centuries really controlling the trade in the Indian Ocean. And geopolitical, geoeconomics, and from the geostrategic point of view, the Indian Ocean has been hugely important over the years, over the centuries. You know, there are about 36, more than 36 littoral states, all are developing countries in the Indian Ocean. And all these countries for centuries, you know, have been influenced by the colonial powers. All of them have come through the sea. So we need to understand the importance of the ocean. Two-thirds of the world's seaborne trade, you can see on the slide, 50% of the world's seaborne container traffic, one-third of the bulk cargo and more than 1,000, 100,000 ships per year transit through the ocean. Now the Bay of Bengal is connected with the Indian Ocean. You can see this is the apex of the Bay of Bengal is Bangladesh. Bay of Bengal here, Bangladesh, connects the South Asia with the Southeast Asia. And historically, Bay of Bengal has been very, very important for trade, commerce, where the cultures all have been intertwined in the past. And Bay of Bengal also recent years has become at the crux, apex of the Indo-Pacific region. See this map. Indo-Pacific region, that is the new concept we have. It is two oceans but one system. Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. It is two oceans, one system. In the Indo-Pacific region, Bay of Bengal is just almost at the center. And we are linking both the oceans. Then, see this map? The Bay of Bengal through Bangladesh, it connects up with the Kunming of China, the India Northeast, other landlocked countries like Nepal, Bhutan. So this is a very important place that we are. So-called Maritime Silk Route, One Belt, One Road Initiative by China. So Maritime, Maritime Silk Route historically passes through the Bay of Bengal. Okay, now what are the challenges of blue economy? Firstly, you see, you can see the figure, but I would say this is an underestimate, but I have still taken it uh, from, a, uh, from an authority. U.S. dollar 24 trillion is the ocean's asset with a 2.5 trillion U.S. dollar value addition every year. We have got unsustainable extraction of fisheries and other resources. We have got destruction of marine and coastal habitats, climate change issues, sea level rise and marine pollution. These are some of the issues that we see in the ocean, which are the challenges of blue economy. Now, I talked a little while earlier about the IUU fishing. Illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. And this is the major challenge, is the unsustainable fishing. Just see this figure. In 1970s, the underexploited fisheries was 40%, and whether it has come down to 15% in 2008, whether the overexploitation, 10% to 32% in 2008. That means where the fisheries was underexploited 50 years back, and now it is overexploited. 
So that means it's no more sustainable, and that is the thing that's a big concern. Ocean acidification. 26% increase in the acidity of the ocean, you know, the, when the carbon is absorbed there, and you can see this slide gives a, some comprehensive idea about the ocean acidification, and what it affects, just for example, accretion in the coral reef, our St. Barnes Island, there's a coral island, so accretion in the coral reef, and worldwide, because of the ocean acidification, the coral reefs are, in, are now endangered. Now there is a concept called the blue carbon. You know, the sea marshes, salt marshes, the mangroves. Sundarbans is the largest mangrove forest in the world, and it is in the World Heritage Site. You know, mangrove, sea marshes, seaweeds, all the vegetation at sea, they fix carbon 10 times more speed, more faster than the land forest. So it's good for, for the climate, good for the environment. So because of this, when they do the photosynthesis, because so more carbon they take, more oxygen they release. So it's good for the nature. But unfortunately, see the statistics down. 30 to 50 percent mangroves have been reduced. 29 percent of the seagrass habitats have been reduced in the last 150 years. So that is a cause of concern. Another challenge. So blue economy and sustainable maritime development. So what is blue economy? So in a, it's a developing country initiative. And you see, you might have heard of the name of uh, about Rio Plus 20 conference. You know, those are various art summits they have taken. So in Rio Plus 20 conference, which was taken in 2012, that was the first time when actually officially and formally the con concept of blue economy has started emerging. Okay, though there was a gentleman called Gunter Pauli, many of have, uh, might have heard about Gunter, Gunter Pauli. He has talked about, you know, sort of blue economy, but green economy concept. So the blue economy has, is a new term, just about nine or 10 years recently. And many countries are still in the def defining stage of blue economy. What is blue economy? Okay, so this is basically, this was initiated by the developing country. So basically, Blue economy promotes the marine-based economic development that leads to the improved human well-being and social equity. And it emphasizes on reducing the environmental risk and scarcities, ecological scarcity. So one thing, blue economy has to ensure the poverty eradication. Blue economy has to ensure the social equity. These are the key words. More, you see, this is from, I have taken an example, definition from uh, Indian uh, National Maritime Foundation. Uh, sustainable ocean economy emerges when economic activity is in balance with the long-term capacity of the ocean ecosystem to support this activity and remain resilient and healthy. So, remain resilient. Economic economy which is resilient and healthy. At the same time, the ocean atmosphere and environment should be resilient and healthy no degradation of the biodiversity of the ecosystem integrity. Another definition. Ocean economy applies, you see, so important is this slide, you see, difference between the ocean economy and blue economy. So ocean economy applies collectively to ocean industry activities and the assets, goods and ecosystems without any indication of sustainability. But blue economy, the major difference is when the ocean economy is sustainable, that leads to blue economy. So, what is the difference? If somebody asks what is the difference between ocean and blue economy, you see, the difference is it has to be sustainable. So, what we get? Blue economy is ocean economy, which is sustainable, which ensures the poverty eradication, which ens ensures the social equity, and of course, the ecosystem integrity. So, some of the prospects and potentials, <coughs> I'll just go, <coughs> go quickly. I'll request you to just give me. Uh, five minutes uh, that's, warning. That's right. warning. Yeah. Well yeah. Okay. So marine fisheries uh, is one of the major aspect of the blue economy prospects. So fisheries comprise fin fish, shellfish, demersal fishes, aquatic animals, and all the aquatic products. One billion people in developing countries depend on the seafood. And in Bangladesh, you see, there are 475 species of fish found in exclusive economic zone are at sea in Bangladesh and only 250 sweetwater species. But we only know about what, koi mach, tangra mach and all these fish. We don't, we hardly know about the tuna fish. 
you see that is the that is the you know negative aspect here that whenever we talk about the sea fish all over the world they talk about sea fish they eat and in bangladesh we are yet to know about sea fish except the people who live in chittagong and other places of course so this is one issue we are lagging behind so just want just see 475 species in sea compared to the 215 in in the seawater so that is what is the prospect of fisheries in bangladesh unfortunately the deep sea fishing this is one thing still we are lagging behind but industries are coming up nowadays aquaculture multi tropic offshore aquaculture is the fastest growing global food sector providing 47% of the fish for human consumption multi tropic offshore aquaculture you see those those are at sea open sea so this is and of course we have got you know uh, shrimp shrimp aquaculture we have got you know uh, all the shrimp uh, cultivation is there so we are doing very good in the shrimp culture excellent so we have the culture we have the uh, expertise we have the uh, local uh, population who are expert in that so we just need to need a little bit of more technology uh, uh, if we really want to prosper in this marine biotechnology one of the fastest emerging high technology sectors and market now is a five billion dollar market in 2020 wide-ranging applications include pharmaceuticals cosmetics nutritional supplements enzymes agrochemicals anything you know nowadays the cancer treatment is you know uh, done by uh, uh, marine uh, from marine compounds uh, there are also other issues these are the antibiotics are there you might have heard the name of omega-3 that is from fish sea fish omega-3 you know we always uh, some sometimes when we grow a little older we get this uh, uh, food uh, nutritional supplement uh, from USA Canada we bring these so many of those you'll see from Omega 3 okay offshore energy and deep sea mining this is something that I'm sure all of you know the gas blocks there are about 26 gas blocks in the coastal oil and gas blocks in the uh, uh, in the coastal belt coastal and sea areas uh, which has been done by the Ministry of Energy and uh, Mineral Resources uh, a number of uh, after and the good uh, big news is after our delimitation of the maritime boundary with Indian Myanmar now we are in the process of leasing out the blocks for um, uh, you know uh, uh, PSC the production sharing contracts and I'm sure big days are coming for Bangladesh in future and uh, we are very hopeful we have got a number of geologists here Dr. Afta from my university, he's a geologist and a lot of, I'm sure others are there, they can really bear me out on this particular case. Just see the figure, 32% of the currently, out of the overall global supply of hydrocarbons, comes from seabed. Marine tourism, already Professor Rashidul Hassan has uh, talked on marine tourism, uh, so I am just showing two beautiful pictures but uh, the most important uh, part here is the five percent of the world gdp depends on the marine tourism whatever developing country you talk indonesia malaysia sri lanka everybody is relying on marine tourism huge so why not us unfortunately the rohingya issue has really caused a little bit of setback because that is the belt cox's Bazar techna belt is the ideal place for the marine tourism i'm sure things are being worked out Shipping port and maritime logistics. Uh, we have a number of shipping experts here. I can see Captain Zillur here. He will talk uh, uh, more about this. But shipping port and maritime logistics, you know what is this picture? This is the ships taken from the satellite. All these are ships taken from the satellite. Just imagine all these are ships. So 80% of the global trade by volume and 70% by value carried by sea. And what we need? We need deep sea port. We need energy efficient shipping. We need smart port. That is what we need. Good news. Pyra port is coming up. Matarbari port. I am very hopeful about the Matarbari port. You know Matarbari is near Cox's Bazar, Maheshkali. And uh, uh, we are uh, uh, under construction port under with the help of uh, JICA from Japan. And by 2023, we are expecting the first phase of the deep, deep water port of Matarbad is coming, going to come out, to my, to my knowledge. So we are very hopeful. You see, our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has always talked about the regional connectivity. 
and that's very important. And for the regional connectivity, we need deep sea ports for transshipment, for uh, other trans logistics, for the freights. So this is very important. Without regional connectivity, no country can go alone. If we close the border, there is no, you know, uh, there is, you can't help, you can't improve. You need to move across. It's a free trade, free border. Just see Europe. For centuries, Europe has been fighting with one another. And what we see now is a one Europe, you know? And everybody, all are under the Eurozone, all are, all are developing. This is a wonderful concept. So regional connectivity is the key word for future, remember. Shipbuilding, I'll just go quickly. You know, there is, uh, uh, I just wanted to show this is another big prospect. Bangladesh is doing great, thank you, in, in this particular sector. Ship breaking is the recycling, uh, recycling of the uh, ships. So marine renewable energy, you know, by the picture you can see the, uh, from the wind turbines and also from uh, wave energy uh, and uh, tidal energy and uh, so on and so forth. So ocean governance is something which is important for Bangladesh and maritime security also is part of the ocean governance. Just I would like to show this slide. Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, she mentioned a few years back, Peaceful and prosperous ocean realm of the Bay of Bengal through the integrated and cooperative partnership would determine the future development and economic growth of Bangladesh. This is so important for us. Now, this is one slide that you see a lot of development works are taking place on the southeastern part of Bangladesh here. New special economic zones, coastal industries, energy clusters, offshore oil and gas exploration, FSRU, you know, the floating uh, uh, terminals for LNG, all these. So there are three, projects, three targets ahead. One is the Bangladesh Delta Plan, BDP 2100, that is for 100 years plan, which really deals with the Delta management, integrated water resources management, and climate change. Vision 2041 by the Honorable Prime Minister to take Bangladesh up to the level of developed country. And the Sustainable Development Goals Target 14, the life below water, which really talks about sustainable sea. So, you know, Maritime industries earlier were neither controlled nor governed well. There are a lot of duplication of efforts. So we need better maritime governance. So what are the initiatives by Bangladesh? One is the BORI, you know, Bangladesh Ocean Research Institute has been constituted for research. On the left, the blue economy cell is there of the government, which coordinates all the public sectors. And, you know, the, by the leadership of Honorable Prime Minister, she has established the university where I am heading, and Maritime University for Maritime Higher Education and Research. These are the, some of the commitments Bangladesh has made to the, in the UN Gen Ocean Conference in June 2017, like, you know, uh, having a marine protected area by 2020, reduce the IUU fishing, and reduce the marine pollution. Portland development, just one slide I wanted to show. You might have heard the name of port of Shenzhen in China. Shenzhen was a fishing village 40 years back. Today, Shenzhen is among the 10 top container ports in the world. Project Sagarmala by India, connecting all the ports, connectivity, Sagarmala. That's, these are the concepts that we, we have scope to follow for port-led development. That means it should be port-centric national development. That is one concept that many people say nowadays. Maritime crime and security management, we should look after that. It is, you know, okay, human trafficking, rowing issue is one issue. Then other than that, uh, you know, piracy, smuggling, and all these issues are there. We have got a separate session on, on, on uh, human trafficking and uh, maritime security a little, a little later. So these are the issues. We need a common security structure for that. Ocean policy, I mentioned at the beginning, we need a comprehensive ocean policy for that. And they should, these five elements, thank you. They should, these five elements, conservation of marine biological diversity, regional marine planning, ecosystem integrity, multiple ocean use, and marine protected areas. This should be in the ocean policy. So what are the way ahead? Last two slides. Develop ocean account and monitor progress. We need to know how much ocean resources we have. You know, Bureau of Statistics, they need to work it out. We need to be sure. Because once we know, then we can set a target. We want to go from here to there. Coordinated policy, policy directives, the capacity buildings, technological, research, academics, institutional, everything. Prioritize sectors. 
all the sectors of ocean resources may not be good for us. We need to prioritize few sectors first. Marine spatial planning, that is the coordinated planning among, among all the countries, the Bay of Bengal, ocean policy, collaboration and partnership, public-private partnership, maritime education and skill. These are some of the major issues. And you see the Bay of Bengal support of the international community is so important. I mentioned in the beginning, ocean is universal. So we need the support of all the regional countries, cooperation among all the regional countries for this. And this is my last slide. Design global and regional partnership toward the achievement of ocean governance and sustainable maritime development. I think, Professor Chris, I have finished on time. You have finished on time. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.